Hey folks, welcome back. We are zeroing in towards the very end of the second unit. That's what happens when the third branch of government comes out. The third branch of government we've talked about, the legislative branch which makes the laws, the executive branch which enforces the laws. Now we gotta get across the finish line. We gotta do that by talking about the judiciary branch or the judicial branch is what I meant to say. Uh, which is, uh, which, whose job it is to interpret the law. Now, too often, again, this is the very end of the second unit. After this chapter, you get into the exam, and it's natural that as the exam ramps up, your focus starts to shift a bit towards preparing for that exam, and that's good, that's important. But, in your preparation, don't overlook this chapter. Sometimes you look past this chapter getting ready for the exam. Don't do that because this isn't the easiest chapter to get through. But fortunately, I'm here to sail the ship of the judicial branch, the USS Chapter 12. Hop aboard, all hands on deck. Let's get ready to swab this poop deck here and figure out what exactly this branch is, what exactly it's doing, what are some of the issues surrounding it we should be aware of. First things first, obviously, uh, I, I just said this at the very beginning, you need to know what all three branches of government do. Now we're here to talk about the judicial branch and its job is to interpret the law. Interpret the law, okay? We'll talk about why that's necessary in two seconds. First of all, you'll notice that of the three branches, this is the third one we're talking about. Once again, I'm not being creative here. I did not make a choice. I'm not even marching to the drum of the textbook. I'm marching to the drum of the Constitution itself. Its job is to interpret the law. Now, as far as that's concerned, why is that something we need the judicial branch to do? Can't the law just speak for itself? Can't the Constitution just speak for itself? Some of these regulations, we talked about agencies and such, uh, in chapter 11. Can't these regulations speak for themselves? Why do we need a judicial branch to step in and say this is what we need things to mean? Well, generally that's because the law and the Constitution is vague. Many of these regulations can be vague. Sometimes the law and regulations collide. Sometimes the law and the Constitution collide. Sometimes these things collide. And they don't explain themselves very well. We talk about this some over the course of this semester. And what we need is an arbiter. And that's what the court system is supposed to be. An arbiter to settle these vaguenesses for us whenever they create problems, to settle these disagreements whenever they arise. We give the judicial branch the arbiter role. That's what we're talking about here. Now obviously, settling these disagreements, clearing up vaguenesses in the law, that's uh, that, that's good, that's a really important job. But that's actually not even the most powerful thing the courts do. The most powerful thing they do we call judicial review. Judicial review is probably the most powerful thing the courts do. Probably the most powerful thing the courts do. And judicial review doesn't mean simply we're interpreting the law now or we're interpreting the Constitution. We're actually straight up defending the Constitution. Anything that the courts perceive as violating the Constitution, the courts can vacate or overturn, meaning they can shut it down. They can overrule a law or a regulation or an executive order. Higher courts can overrule lower courts if they find any of those things to be unconstitutional. That's what we call judicial review. It was actually established in this really old court case called Marbury versus Madison. Judicial review is actually not in the Constitution, oddly enough. The most powerful thing courts have is not in the Constitution. The courts simply ruled that they had that power. That's interesting that the courts gave themselves that power. They did it in Marbury versus Madison there, John Marshall writing the opinion, but it's true. The court, the, uh, the court case from the 1700s of Marbury versus Madison gave the courts, essentially the courts gave themselves the power of judicial review. Okay. Now, with that in mind, let's cover some more of these basics here, okay? Let's cover some more of the basics. First things first, what do you got to be? If you want to be a judge, 
what qualifications are in the Constitution. Now, earlier this semester, I gave you an assignment for you to go over the Constitution. It included Article 3, which talked about judges. Do you remember what qualifications are in Article 3 to be a judge? Trick question. If you don't remember anything, that's the correct thing, because there's actually nothing in the Constitution that says you need this or this or this to be a judge. There are no qualifications listed. So how do you end up becoming a judge? How do you end up becoming qualified for a judge? Stay tuned. We'll get there eventually. Now, before we get into any of that stuff, what about your terms? Obviously, if you're going to be in the House of Representatives, you get a two-year term. If you're going to be a president, you get a four-year term. If you're going to be in the Senate, you've got a six-year term. In the court system, you actually have a life term. Now, that's not the language that the Constitution provides. The Constitution does not say you serve for life. The Constitution says you get to serve for good behavior. Good. So as long as your behavior is good, you get to be a uh, federal judge for the rest of your life until you retire or kind of die in your robes. That can happen from time to time. Now, oddly enough, we ha you can't, if you, uh, um, uh, if you have had bad behavior as a judge, you can be removed from your office via impeachment and removal. So just like we talked about in Chapter 10, how Congress can remove the president from office, Congress can also remove a federal judge from office. This has really only happened a dozen or so times. You don't need to know any of this. I'm just trying to give you some factoids here. This actually happened about a dozen so, uh, or so times over a course of American history. Judges being removed for mental instability. Obviously, you want your judges to be sharp, right? Uh, abuse of power, you know, taking bribes or favoritism, being drunk on the job, that's bad. Right, uh, Sexual assault, obviously that'd be really bad, even though that has nothing strictly to do with you being a judge. It obviously has something to do with you, the character of you. So sexual assault obviously is a big problem. One judge was removed for waging war against the United States government. This is true. It's this guy right here. His name is West Hughes Humphreys. He was a, a, he was a judge of the Confederacy. He was a pro-Confederacy judge around the time of the Civil War. Obviously the Confederacy lost the war, and as a result, I mean, if you're going to support the South against the North, uh, which had the Constitution, obviously it means you're probably unfit to, be con to continue being a judge after the Civil War. So, West Hughes Humphreys here, handsome devil though he may be, kind of looked like Walter Goggins a little bit. But uh, Go ahead, Google Walter Goggins and put these two pictures up next to each other. Kind of looks like him. If there's ever a movie about West Hughes Humphreys, I'm expecting Walter Goggins to play him. All right. So one of the now one thing you may know is that we have local courts here in I'm in Springfield, Missouri. Most of you are probably in Springfield, Missouri in the Ozarks. Uh, almost all of you are going to be in Missouri. <clears throat> you can have local courts. There are going to be state courts. But of course, what we focus on in this class is federal, national level. So we have federal courts. Now, you might be asking why would a federal court be hearing my case instead of a state court or instead of any other court? Well, it depends. You need several things to be in place before a federal court can agree to hear you. Okay. So the first thing you need in place is you need to be in the right jurisdiction. You need to be in the right district. Obviously, um, a federal court in Missouri is not going to listen to you if the dispute you're having is in Oregon and a a federal court in, you know, Massachusetts is not going to hear you if the dispute you're having is in Colorado. That doesn't make any sense. First of all, you need to be in the right jurisdiction. And you've probably heard of that word before, jurisdiction. Obviously, that means you need to be in the right physical area. The dispute you're having needs to be a dispute over a certain physical area, and you need the correct court to oversee that dispute. Now, on top of that, a federal court will hear you instead of a state court or any other court because you have a federal question. Now, a federal question, this is kind of, this is not the best answer in the world, but it's the true answer. Why do you need a federal court instead of any other court? Well, because the dispute you're having is federal, meaning it's spewing from, it's branching off from some federal law or federal, you know, action, maybe a presidential action, maybe a military action. So these are all federal things. Uh, including federal laws. Obviously, if you and I are having a dispute over a state law, a state court will hear us. If we're having a dispute over a federal law, a federal court will hear us. Now, there is an exception to that. It's possible you and I could be fighting over a state law and have a federal court hear us if there is something called diversity of citizenship. 
meaning you and I are from two different parts of the, of the country. If I'm from New Jersey and you're from California and we're fighting over like some state law in either of our states, theoretically, a New Jersey court would be favorable for me. I mean, theoretically, and theoretically, a California court would be favorable for you. So to kind of get an independent referee here, we might actually discard those state courts and have a federal court jump in because theoretically, the federal court in this instance would be neutral. Again, that's that's all in theory. So this is why you would have a federal court hear you. Now, for the record, a court's not going to hear just any challenge. There, and so at this point, let me prepare you. Let me prepare you for my least favorite term of the semester. Are you ready for my least favorite term? Because I hate terms that are complicated and, ex <laughs> and are unnecessarily complicated. Here is that term. If you want your court case heard in federal court, you need jurisdiction, you need a federal question and or diversity of citizenship. And you need something called a justiciable controversy, which is hard enough to say. Justiciable controversy. That's really, that's, I can't tell you how many times I have to practice saying that before I do these recorded lectures. I'm in front of my mirror in the morning. Justiciable, justiciable, justiciable. Justiciable controversy is a really irritating term because all it means is that you have a real conflict. You have an actual thing that you're actually fighting over. That's all justiciable controversy means. Now what that means is courts don't hear hypotheticals. They don't care about your hypothetical. If you and I are like kind of having a dispute and we notice like there is some legal situation where you and I could really have a dispute in the future, we can't go to the courts and say, okay, so theoretically, if Crocker and I get in a fight about this, how would you rule? Courts are swamped as it is. They don't care about your hypotheticals. They only care about actual conflicts or what the textbook calls and what the legal system calls a justiciable controversy. That is a real term, and I hate it. Make sure you know it, though, okay? Now, on top of that, in that hypothetical I just gave you where you and I are fighting, that's what most court cases are going to be like. You're going to have two parties involved. Now, you could have two parties involved because it's a criminal case, and a criminal case is where the state or the government is essentially putting an individual on trial uh, in order to maybe go to prison or to pay a fine or both. So that's what a criminal trial is. You've broken some criminal law and now you're on trial as to whether or not you need to go to jail. Uh, there's also civil suits uh, where nobody's going to go to jail. Instead, it's you and me. We both, one of us thinks the other has, you know, done them wrong. And as a result, I'm going to sue you for what's mine. Um, that actually, it's, it's 2021. So forgive me if this is a dated reference, but I'm a big Marvel fan. I'm a big Black Widow fan, Scarlett Johansson. Scarlett Johansson sued Disney over the release of Black Widow. Uh, she thought they, they violated the terms of the contract they had with her. You know, nobody's going to jail here. Disney's not going to jail, uh, though they may deserve to. <laughs> Scarlett Johansson's definitely not going to jail. This is a civil suit where you have two parties that are upset with each other, said they did them wrong. Go ScarJo. Now, on top of that, there are instances where there might be more than two people involved. For instance, if you as a student want to sue me, it is you versus me. That's how more, most court cases are. But instead of you, like all y'all in this class want to sue me, then that's what we call a class action lawsuit. I mean, it's literally called a class action. That's where you have a group of people suing an individual or a group of people suing a party. And a group of people may do that. You see this sometimes with banks, like a bunch of customers will get together, form a class action lawsuit against a bank saying, hey, your fees are you know, a violation of some sort of rule or contract that we signed together. This is a class action lawsuit. Obviously, you don't have two parties now. You have one party versus like a whole bunch. Okay, matter of fact, when Donald Trump was running for president back in 2016, while he was running for president, he was the subject of a class lawsuit, a class action lawsuit. There's something called Trump University which is a almost entirely fraudulent school that he invented, racked up people, racked up you know, millions of dollars in credit card debt from potential students for Trump University. And when it turned out there was no real education involved, they all got together and they sued uh, then candidate Trump. Uh, and once he won the election, he settled the lawsuit for like $25 million. It's a class action lawsuit. Now there's also an instance where, let's, say, let's go back to you and I. You and I are suing each other, but there's this 
third party, and I don't know, just let's visually illustrate a third party for a moment, shall we? Uh, here's a third party. Hi. It's me. Okay, there's your third party. You and I are suing each other as the most you, you <laughs> as the most pointless use of uh, illustration in a lecture. But anyways, you and I are suing each other, and there is a third party watching our dispute. This third party is watching our dispute. They're not involved in this dispute, but they have kind of done the math. And they have kind of figured, you know, I'm not in that dispute, but I bet you if Crocker loses, it could be good for me. And as a result, this third party may file an argument on your behalf to help you beat me. Okay, that's the third party right there. And we call this an amicus curiae brief. Or some t I, I also heard it called an amicus curiae brief. Latin is hard is what I'm trying to say. But an amicus curiae brief is when a third party that has nothing to do with you and I, like they are not involved in our dispute, they want to file some arguments on your behalf to try to help you beat me because it would help them in the long run. So goes amicus curiae briefs. Okay. You know what? I like them up there. I'm going to leave them up there for a few until some future slide takes them away from me. I like having you there. You're keeping me company. Thank you. I appreciate you. All right, so with that in mind, let's go to the court system as a whole and kind of figure out how this sucker is arranged. Why is the court system arranged the way that it's arranged? Now, when you look at the Constitution, what does it say? What does it say about how the court system needs to be set up? Well, it really only says one thing. The Constitution only says one thing. It largely doesn't arrange the federal court system at all. It gives Congress the responsibility. Congress, you can arrange the court system however you want with one exception. That exception is the Supreme Court. The Constitution really only says there needs to be one Supreme Court. And it leaves everything up to Congress. Everything after that is up to Congress. Okay? Constitution says there needs to be one Supreme Court. Now, as far as co what Congress has done is they set up a three-tiered judicial branch. And this is what it looks like. You have district courts, courts of appeals and the Supreme Court. Let's walk through each of them, shall we? Okay. Now, if you and I are having a dispute, if you and I are having a federal level dispute, we will start here. We'll start with the district court somewhere in America. There's about 90 of these courts. I don't need you to know exactly how many, but there are 90 of these court, 90 some of these courts throughout America. They have something called original jurisdiction. You don't need to worry about that. Anyways, this is kind of what a normal court is supposed to look like. Normal with quotes, of course. The court that you've seen on TV, the court that you've seen in movies, you're watching a version of a district court. This is where you're going to see all the stuff that's like the hallmark of a court of a trial. You're going to have a judge, you'll have a jury, you'll have uh, evidence, cross-examinations, opening statements, super dramatic closing statements. and eventually somebody's going to win. Now, whoever ends up winning, congratulations, life is good for you, I'm sure. A lot better than the person who lost anyways. However, the party that lost has the ability to appeal the ruling. And you appeal to the next level, which is literally called the Courts of Appeals, also known as appellate courts, also known as appellate courts. There's about 13 of these throughout America. 13 of these throughout America. Obviously, there's like 90-some district courts. You appeal to the appropriate appeals court directly above you, and you'll essentially say that the lower court made some mistake. They handled something wrong. They made the wrong decision. They misread something. Or in the trial, they made a mistake, and therefore everything should be vacated or whatever. They're, you're making an argument that the lower court made an argument. And uh, essentially, if the court of appeal agrees with you that it might be a mistake that the lower court made, they'll issue something called a writ of certiorari. And again, this is hard because it's Latin, but that's writ of certiorari. I have the, uh, you know, the, uh, what's that phrase called? The phonetic, spe the phonetic spelling on the bottom left there on your screen. Certiorari, though, that's what that's called, the writ of certiorari. 
if the appeals court thinks you may have a case, it's not that they agree with you yet, but they think you may have a case, they will issue a writ of certiorari. And what that means is, you know what, we will hear what the lower court, we'll hear your complaints about the lower court, basically. We'll hear your complaints about the lower court's ruling. Now, for the record, um, you're, you're, this is not going to look like a regular court like this does. Instead, you're going to have a panel of judges now, not a judge with a jury. There's no jury at this level. It's just a panel of judges. And then you're really going to have two lawyers. One lawyer is going to argue on behalf of the ruling made by the lower court. Probably, again, if I lost the case and you won the case, um, you are going, your lawyer is going to take the floor and say, well, the lower court decided it right. What are we doing here? We're wasting everybody's time. Whereas my lawyer will say, the lower court was a mistake. They made a mistake or it was a sham or they completely were wrong. Please reverse the ruling of the lower court. Now, whatever the court of appeals ends up doing, you can appeal the courts of appeals. And that's where the Supreme Court comes in. Okay, The Supreme Court will hear your appeal to the appeals courts. There's a lot of appealing going on here. That's kind of the idea. Now, the Supreme Court listens to a very small percentage of these cases. There's tens of thousands of cases in our federal court system a year. The Supreme Court every year hears 70. So the odds that they will hear your case are very small, and the chances that they'll hear your case are going to be maybe a few years down the line. A few years down the line. So your Supreme Court, in case you don't already know, has nine judges. And of these nine judges, you need at least four of them four of them to agree to hear your case in order for four of them to um, four of them need to agree to issue some sort of writ of certiorari from the appellate courts okay now once again the supreme court is essentially an appellate court four appellate courts it will have a panel of judges you have nine judges then you'll have two lawyers a lawyer on both sides they each get half an hour to make their case and then the supreme court will weigh in however they see fit on the issue after they issue their ruling there's not much you can, I mean, you could always appeal to God, but <laughs> legally, there's really not much further you can go. Now, let's work through one of these court cases. How does a court case typically work? How does a court case usually work? Here's, here's, the, here's the idea. You and I have a dispute, like, you know, party A has a dispute. Let's get a different color up in here, shall we? Party A has a dispute against party B. That's not very good. That's not a good color. That's not a good color for in here. Let's get a new color, shall we? I do love the soothing purple, but you just can't see it in here. <laughs> okay. Maybe I should have stuck with this color. Let's do a little neon pink, shall we? A versus B. Yeah. It's good enough. All right, so you have two parties that are bad at each other. A and B are upset with each other. Now, since that's the case, they're going to take their dispute to court. The first thing they'll do is they'll put their key arguments in something called a brief, which, by the way, is called a brief because it's short. So A will say, we should win this dispute. Here's why. And that dispute will be like three or four pages long. B will issue an, a brief as well. The courts will review the briefs, and then after that, you'll have oral argument. Now again, oral argument depends on what, what's going on. What kind of court uh, are we in? What kind of dispute do we have? Is this a criminal case? If this is a criminal case, then oral argument will be the trial. Uh, if this is not a criminal case, if it's a civil case, maybe you still have a trial, but if you get to the appellate level, this is when you have your panel of judges and two lawyers making their argument. That's, so oral argument can take several forms. However, as soon as oral argument is over, the judges excuse themselves, they confer, and the next time you hear from them, you'll get yourself a ruling. The judges will issue an opinion. They'll issue an actual ruling. Now, when you get to these upper courts, like appellate courts or the Supreme Court, you have several judges. You have a panel of judges. That does mean that among these judges, there can be disagreements. Let's say in this dispute between party A and party B, you get some bright yellow now going here. 
let's say if we're at the Supreme Court and there's nine judges, there's nine judges at the Supreme Court, we'll say that six of them agree that party A should win and three of them believe that party B should win, okay? So clearly party A is your winner. However, you have some disagreement. As a result, there are many times where a court's ruling will have several different parts to it. Let's talk about that right now. Now, this will, the court will start with this right here, YA1. We call that the majority opinion. We call that the majority opinion. And guys, if you want, put a little star right next to the majority opinion because guys, of all the parts of this case, of all the different rulings you're about to see, the majority ruling is the only ruling that has any legal authority. This is the official ruling. This is the only part that has any legal authority. They're going to say A wins, B loses, and then they'll list the reasons why A won, which is important. It'll guide future cases. So they'll argue A wins for these number of reasons. Okay? That's the majority ruling. Now, it is possible that of these six judges here in the majority, it's possible that like one or maybe two of them, it's possible that like one or two of them might agree. They agree with the majority. A should win. B should lose. They agree with that. They agree with that. However, maybe reasons one, two, and three weren't very convincing to them. Maybe instead of reasons one, two, and three, maybe A should have won because of reasons four, five, and six, maybe. Now, if these one or two judges feel that way, they can issue their own opinion called a concurring opinion. And again, that's they're going to confirm that A wins. A wins, B loses. We are not disagreeing on that point. We're not disagreeing on the conclusion. We're disagreeing on the reasoning. So once again, a concurring opinion is where a minority of judges agree with the conclusion of the majority but they disagree with the reasoning. One more time, a minority of judges agree with the conclusion of the majority, but they disagree with the reasoning. Now, if that's the case, why even give them their own platform? Does the concurring opinion have any legal authority whatsoever? The answer is no. The only opinion that has any legal authority is the majority opinion. So if that's the case, why even bother with the concurring opinion? Why even bother with that? We haven't even gotten to these guys yet. Obviously, they're on the losing side altogether. Why even bother with concurring opinion? Well, there's a couple different reasons why. One of those is that judges are divas, and uh, if they don't get their way, they like having a platform to complain. We, pro we provide that. It doesn't cost us anything to have a concurring opinion printed, so there you go. Now, on top of that, though, oftentimes, History may justify the judges that didn't get their way. Sometimes the, the history may look back at this court case 50 years from now and they were like, you know what, even though, they, even though the, the court got A right, maybe it should have been for different reasons all along. And they may end up agreeing with the concurring down the line. So courts may, uh, you know, in the future overrule and cite this concurring opinion as to why they did. You don't need to know that necessarily, but... Obviously, you need to know what a majority opinion is, you need to know what the concurring opinion is, and you need to know what the dissenting opinion is, otherwise known as the dissent, where obviously the judges on the losing side of the conflict get to complain about how B should have won. And sometimes they can do some pretty fiery language here, uh, but uh, that's not usually common. Normal, the most, uh, look at the Supreme Court altogether. The Supreme Court almost half the time rules 9 to 0, almost half the time rules unanimously. And it's, you only rarely do you get like a minority opinion that's particularly heated, but it's possible. Like if you get a four to five ruling, obviously. Now, again, when you look at those, remember that big triangle I showed you just a second ago where you had the Supreme Court at the top, then appeals courts, then district courts. Think of those two top two levels, appeals courts and the Supreme Court. Really what those two levels of courts do is they're just always weighing in on what the lower courts have already decided. Appeals courts only really care about the district courts beneath them. Supreme Court overrules and can overrule just about everybody below them. Okay, So really these, two, these top two levels of courts really only care about what lower courts before them have already decided. 
And so that means that these upper courts are really just going to issue three different kinds of rulings. There's really three different kinds of rulings that appeals courts and supreme courts can issue. One of these rulings is known as affirming, meaning you've ruled in favor of the lower court. The lower court, and this is what they'll usually do because, you know, courts can obviously make mistakes, but for the most part, courts are staffed by very smart, very capable people, and they don't often make huge mistakes um, that upper courts need to correct. And as a result, usually these upper courts will rule with what we call an affirm. We affirm what the lower court uh, has done here. Obviously, it can go the other way. If they think the lower Kate, uh, lo uh, the, <laughs> let me try that again. If they think the lower court uh, got the case completely wrong, they can straight up reverse it. Where they say the lower court got it wrong, we reverse. They can do that. And then there's a third option where they say the lower court didn't get it right or wrong. Instead, they will simply say the lower court made a mistake. They need to go back to the chalkboard and start all over again. That's what these upper courts may rule from time to time, and that's called remanding. That's when a case gets sent back down to the lower court uh, that originally heard it and say, maybe they made a bad mistake, maybe for some reason the lower court gave the jury bad instructions, bad slanted instructions that poisoned the well, uh, again, poisoned the jury against either the defendant or the prosecution or something. And as a result, you need to go back, give the jury better instructions, and do it again. Now, as a result, that's going to be a huge pain in the tail. And some of these lower courts will just say, well, I mean, we're just not going to hear it again. So if they say we're not going to hear it again, then that means, you know, the... Uh, court case got vacated and the lower court wasn't interested in rehearing it. That does happen. But it's a lot better than bad justice. If you give, let's for instance, if you give the jury bad instructions, that poisons the well. You can't really have a good ruling off of that. You either need to abandon that case altogether, which is what some courts will do, or rehear it all over again. Now obviously you walk through this step where it starts with you and I having a fight and then eventually the court issues its opinion. And if you're on the losing side of this, you can also appeal whatever the court ruled. Except for the Supreme Court, obviously you can't appeal the Supreme Court. Everybody else, of course, you can appeal. Successfully or unsuccessfully, well, let's see. Let's talk about those judges, though, because judges, again, they will rule how, I mean, we've, we've seen the myriad of ways that they can rule. Um, how do they arrive at their conclusions? One of the mistakes that we make about judges is that we just assume judges rule however they want to rule on whatever issue they want, whenever they want. But that's not true. Judges have to stay within uh, a uh, uh, they have to stay within a certain set of rules. There's probably a word for that that I'm skipping out on right now. Judges have to stay within a certain set of rules. Now, the cert the the, the set of rules that we're talking about here are precedent. As courts rule on a particular issue, they must follow precedent. And that means you have to you have to follow what the courts uh, what uh, you have to follow what the courts before you have ruled on a particular issue. This is also known as the doctrine of stare decisis. Stare decisis and precedent are slightly different. Um, precedent <clears throat> stare decisis is a type of precedent. They are slightly different. But precedent means you have to follow what the courts before you have ruled on whatever issue it is you're currently listening to. So if you're listening to a challenge on flag burning, well, then you have to follow what courts before you have ruled on flag burning. The courts before you were probably run by smart people, probably. And as a result, they know what they're talking about. And so we are not going to allow you to overrule them except in extraordinary circumstances. For the record, though, again, we call this precedent. You have to follow previous rulings. But for the record, you don't actually have to follow all previous rulings. You only have to follow some. You don't have to follow every ruling in the history of America. Instead, you have to follow two categories of rulings. The first is you have to follow all rulings from the courts directly above you. Okay, so if you're a district court, you have to follow the appeals court above you and the Supreme Court, which is directly above everybody. 
But if you're a district court, you have to follow the appeals court that's directly above you. You don't have to follow any other district courts. You can listen to what other district courts have ruled and take them as advice, but you don't have to follow them. You actually don't have to listen to any of the appeals courts either because none of them are direct, only one of them is directly above you. That one you have to follow, but all the others you can ignore. If you're an appeals court, you only have to follow the Supreme Court, okay? You don't have to listen to what any other appeals court has ruled on a given issue. So rule number one, any rulings from the courts directly above you, you must follow. Rule number two, if let's say no court, no court directly above you has weighed in on some issue, then you have to follow your own court's history. Like for instance, if you 10 years ago, if your court 10 years ago ruled that flag burning is unconstitutional, but in the 10 years since you've changed your mind, too bad, you don't get to overrule yourself. The court above you can overrule you, but you can't overrule yourself. I'll give you just a moment to catch up. Let's say goodbye to my friend. Bye. Thank you for hanging out with me for three or four slides. I didn't like him. I felt like he was taking attention away from me. I'm very insecure. <laughs> okay. All right. So clearly judges have a lot to weigh. They can't, they have to be able to put aside, or at least they're supposed to be able to put aside their own personal feelings on a particular subject and follow the, follow first of all the constitution and the law, but also follow previous rulings on such and such issue. So clearly they need to be qualified. Well, one of the things we remember from earlier this semester, from earlier in this lecture, actually one of the first things we talked about in this lecture is that judges actually don't have any qualifications listed in the Constitution. So how do you become a judge? If there's no listed qualifications, how do you become one? Clearly you don't get elected. Now they do elect judges in some states, including in Missouri. We elect judges under certain circumstances. We can't elect new judges, but we can vote to re-elect existing judges. We can do that here in Missouri. But at the federal level, there's no elections for judges. Instead, Step one, the president needs to appoint you. So we talked about this in chapter 10, the president has appointment power. Uh, we talk about that with like cabinet officials and you know national security advisor and stuff like that, but we, we also need to talk about it with judges because the president is in charge of filling all vacancies by appointing replacement judges. The president will usually use deciding factors such as merit, meaning they deserve the job because they're really, they've shown that they would be a really good judge, but also ideology. Conservative presidents will pick conservative judges. Liberal or progressive presidents will pick liberal or progressive judges. So I want to pick judges, if I'm the president, that will reflect my vision for America, I'm probably not going to pick many different judges that have a completely different view of government than I do. Now, one of the things we learned in Chapter 10, folks, one of the things we learned in Chapter 10 is that presidents have appointment power, but for the most important appointments, the president can't just appoint whoever he wants. He has to appoint someone, and then the Senate has to confirm them. Now, that does mean from time to time people will get shot down by the Senate, here is an example of a Trump-appointed judge sitting in for a Senate hearing before the Senate ends up voting on this person. Let's see how well he does under the circumstances. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, gentlemen. Congratulations. Uh, you can just raise your hand on this one, if you will, to save a little time. Have any of you not tried a case to verdict in a courtroom? Mr. Pierce. Um, have you ever tried a jury trial? I have not. Civil? No. Criminal? No. Bench? No. State or federal court? I have not. Okay. Have you ever taken a deposition? I was involved in taking depositions when I was associate uh, mm -hmm. at Wiley Ryan when I um, first came out of law school. Um, but that that was uh you ever how many how many depositions 
I would, um, I'd be struggling to, to, to remember. Uh, Less than 10? Yes. Less than five? Probably somewhere. Okay. You ever try to take a, a deposition by yourself? Uh, I believe no. Okay. Uh, have you ever argued a motion in state court? I have not. Have you ever argued a motion in federal court? No. Uh, when's the last time you read the federal rules of civil procedure? Uh, the federal rules of civil procedure, um, I, uh, in my current position, I obviously don't need to stay as, um, uh, you know, uh, invested in those on a day-to-day -day basis, but I do try to keep up to speed. We do have, uh, at, the, at the Federal Election Commission, roughly 70 attorneys who work under our, our guidance, uh, including a large litigation division. And um, as a commissioner, we oversee that litigation. We advise them on overall legal strategy, uh, provide um, recommendations and edits to briefs and so forth, and meet with them about uh, how we're going to handle If I could ask you this, sure. I'm sorry to interrupt okay. you, but we're only given five minutes for five of you, so. Sure. When's the last time you read the federal rules of evidence? The federal rules of evidence all the way through would, um, well, comprehensively would have been in law school. Uh, obviously, I have been involved in, when I was a, uh, an associate, um, that was uh, something that we had to stay uh, closely abreast of. And um, there have been some issues dealing with evidentiary issues that sure. will cause me to um, examine those periodically in, in, in our oversight role of the litigation division at the Federal Election Commission. Okay. Um, well, as a trial judge, you're obviously going to have witnesses. Yes. Can you tell me what the uh, Dobert standard is? Uh, Senator Kennedy, I, I don't have that uh, readily uh, at my disposal, uh, but I would be happy to take a, a closer look at that. Okay. That, that, that is not something that I've had to okay. uh, contend with. Um, do you know what a motion in limine is? Uh, yes, I have. Um, I'm, I'm, again, my uh, background is not uh, in litigation as, as uh, when I was replying to uh, Chairman Grassley. Um, I haven't had to, um, again, do a deep dive, and I under, and I and I understand, and and I appreciate this this line of questioning. I understand uh, the challenge that would be ahead of me if I were fortunate enough to become a district court judge. I understand that um, that the path that many successful district court judges have taken has been a different one than I have taken. Mm -hmm. um, but I, as I mentioned in my earlier answer, I believe that the, the path that I have taken um, to be one who's been in a decision-making role um, on, uh, I would guess now, somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 enforcement matters, mm -hmm. um, overseeing, I, I don't know how many uh, cases in federal court yes, the commission is, has uh, been a party to during my time. Yes, sir. I've, I've read your, yes. your resume. Um, just for the record, do you know what a motion in limine is? I would probably not be able to give you a good definition okay. right here at the table. At the, uh, okay. table. Um, do you know what the uh, Younger Extension Doctrine is? Uh, Any I, I've that? heard of it, but I, again. That, How about the Pullman Extension Doctrine? I, I heard you don't see You'll all see that a lot in, in federal court. Okay. Um, okay. Um, indeed. <laughs> That job interview did not go well, uh, but of course he he's not being rejected for the job. He rescinded his nomination shortly after this, so he's like, uh, you can't fire me, I quit. So he didn't get to become a judge. Uh, this gentleman didn't. But you know, that's the way it goes. If you're not qualified, if you don't have the merit, you don't get the job. But as I said a moment ago, in this next slide, you don't need to know, I just kind of want you to be understand that Merit, while it is very important, is not the only factor uh, when it comes to whether you end up becoming a judge. You need to have the right ideology. For instance, this is your current Supreme Court. As of 2021, this is your current Supreme Court. These are your nine judges. Everyone from uh, Justice Barrett, 
who just got named back at the tail end of 2020, and Justice Breyer. Now, these top six judges are all conservatives, and these bottom three judges are all liberal or progressive, whatever word you'd prefer to use. Now, these top six conservative judges have all been put in place, coincidentally or not coincidentally, by Republican presidents. Trump put the top three judges in there, Barrett, Kavanaugh, and Gorsuch. Alito and Roberts were put in, and he's uh, John Roberts' chief justice. Not that you need to know that. That's what that parenthesis means, but John Robert is the chief justice. But George W. Bush put the, these two judges in, and then his dad, George H.W. Bush, put Thomas in office. So uh, obviously Thomas has been around the longest. Now, on top of that, you have these bottom three judges, which were all put in place by who? Democratic presidents, of course. Obama put in Kagan and Sotomayor, and Breyer was put in office by Clinton. Obviously, uh, Breyer's been around the longest in that wing. This is not coincidental. It's not just a coincidence. Republicans have put conservatives on the Supreme Court, and Democrats have put progressives on the Supreme Court. That's not a coincidence. Okay, it's, it's by design. Obviously, if I'm a Republican, I want to put somebody who shares my limited government views on the Supreme Court. And, you know, if I'm a more progressive person, I want more progressive judges as well. Now, this can lead to some pretty nasty fights, though. For instance, this is the Supreme Court from 2016, largely the same, but with a couple different additions and subtractions. This particular judge, Antonin Scalia, died in 2016. Died while, you know, well, he was not on the bench. He was not listening to an argument and keeled over. But he died due to natural causes. Uh, and as a result, that creates a 4-4 tie. Kennedy, Alito, Roberts, and Thomas are all conservatives. Scalia was a conservative, too. Kagan, Sotomayor, Breyer, and Ginsburg were all progressives. So you have four, you had five conservative judges and four progressive judges. Now it's 4-4. Four, four. And guess who's president? Democrat Barack Obama. Which means it's possible to now flip the court from a conservative majority to a progressive majority. The problem is, is that while the president gets to nominate you, the Senate needs to confirm you. And in 2016, the Senate was controlled by the Republican Party. So what's going to happen here? You have a judge that uh, you have a president who wants to replace a conservative judge with a progressive judge and a Republican Senate that says no thank you. Well, Obama did his job. He named somebody named Merrick Garland to become the replacement justice. There's him in the middle. There's Barack Obama over here. And current president, but then Vice President Joe Biden over here. There's Merrick Garland right there in the middle. Obama names him, and the Republican Senate actually doesn't even vote him down. They just pretend he doesn't exist. They never had a single hearing on him. They never even publicly acknowledged his existence because it was 2016, and later in the year, you had a presidential election. Republicans won the presidential election with President Trump and replaced Alito's seat with another conservative. Actually, they replaced him with Gorsuch. So as a result, that 5-4 conservative majority stayed in place. Now, with that in mind, one way in which the judicial branch stands out from all three branches is the fact that it is not elected. The, the Congress is elected. The president is elected. Judges on the federal level are not elected. Which then, by the way, does beg the question. It begs the question how proactive should this unelected branch be at shutting down the other two branches? One of the first things we learned about in this conversation was that the judicial branch can do that. They, they can declare actions by the president, such as executive orders, and laws passed by Congress. They can shut them down with judicial review. To what extent should this unelected branch be doing that? Well, that's a should question, and as a result, there's no definitive answer. Uh, there's different theories. One of those theories is called judicial restraint, and as the name suggests, it argues that judges should defer. Judges should defer to the other two branches because they're elected. 
unless they do something particularly egregious. So even though Congress passed a law that might be questionable or, uh, you know, the president has done something that might be questionable, they're largely going to defer to these other two branches whenever humanly possible. But if, like, Congress passes a law saying everybody has to wear brown shirts, that will be ruled unconstitutional as a violation of freedom of expression, right? That's, that's not allowed. You can't force me to wear a certain color. Even though sometimes I'm in this black room and I wish I was wearing a different color, you can't do that. You can't pass a law making me do that. Okay? Supreme Court will shut that down. But short of that, they're just going to let these other two branches pretty much do what they want. Now, the alternative to that, the alternative is judicial activism. And judicial activism says, you know what, I don't care if I'm elected or not. At the end of the day, I'm a co-equal branch. I have the ability to shoot the other branches down if they overstep their bounds. And you know what, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Now, neither one of these is the wrong approach. Neither one of these is wrong or bad. They're just different variations on it. And I'm going to be honest with you. Nobody's really consistent on this at all. Nobody. You, it's very rare for you to meet somebody who's like hardcore judicial activist no matter what or hardcore judicial restraintist no matter what. For the most part, judges and we the people will waffle between these two whenever it serves our political needs. Okay, we'll, we'll change our mind constantly between the two. So here we are, the third branch of government. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, shoot. There's one more slide I wanted to share with you guys. Hold on one second. That's not right. One more slide, but I don't have it. All right, let me... One more slide, but I don't have it, uh, at least on this one. Let me pick up a, <laughs> this is the slide. This is the 2019 version of this lecture. Ta-da, you're not gonna see my face here. <laughs> this is the 2019 version of my lecture. That's really, really silly. Sorry, I didn't have that last slide copied over for this. But anyways, let's talk about this anyways. This is the last thing I want to cover, and this is how the other branches keep the courts in check. Obviously, the judicial branch has judicial review and can shut down what the other two court what the other two branches are doing. But what can these branches do to shut down the courts? Let's talk about that right now. Now, the executive branch, which you see with the White House and of course the words the executive branch, the executive branch can shut down the courts. Uh, by naming the right judges that they don't think are going to disagree with them. Uh, you cannot become a judge in America without having, at least on the federal level, without having the president handpick you. So that's one way presidents can reel in the courts. Another way that presidents can reel in the courts is whenever courts issue their rulings, there's no way that they can enforce the rulings. Courts don't have their own army. It's kind of like a you and whose army type dynamic. Instead, they rely on the executive branch to implement their rulings. Now, that is kind of an interesting dynamic because as we've said before, uh, whenever you are in charge of implementing the law, you can put a ton of personal spin on your implementation. Last but not least, uh, obviously the court system can convict you and put you in jail, but the president can bust you out with pardons and commutations, something we talked about in chapter 10. As far as the legislative branch is concerned, the legislative branch has a couple different ways. We just saw that the executive branch, the president, appoints judges. But as we just talked about with Merrick Garland, you cannot become a judge in America, at least a federal judge, unless the U.S. Senate confirms you. And obviously, they're going to try to confirm judges that will let Congress do whatever it wants. Now, on top of that, if, uh, if judges are exhibiting what we'll call bad behavior. We talked about good behavior earlier, but if they're exhibiting bad behavior, we do give Congress the ability to impeach and remove judges, just like they impeach and remove presidents, or at least could theoretically, if they ever did it. Last but not least, whenever the Supreme Court or any court rules on something, if you don't like their ruling, too bad. Laws can't trump uh, no pun intended there, but laws can't trump judicial rulings. They don't have the ability to. Presidents can't trump judicial rulings. Only one thing can, and that's the Constitution. And if you don't like a ruling by the courts, as we haven't five times, 
five times in American history we've put an amendment in the Constitution to overrule a Supreme Court ruling. For instance, the, um, the Supreme Court in the early 1900s, like the 19 aughts or the 19 teens, I forget exactly when, the early Supreme Court ruled that the income tax is unconstitutional. Now that was a crisis for America because that, that you know, that's the primary way that go, uh, uh, the government gets money. And so as a result, they overruled the Supreme Court with the 16th Amendment. They added the 16th Amendment to the Constitution, which said the, that Congress has the power to raise income taxes. Guys, that right there, <laughs> that was a little unconventional, sorry about that, but that right there is the tail end of chapter 12. I'll have to fix that for the next time I get around to reviewing these. Now, guys, you have an exam coming up to cover all three branches plus the bureaucracy, which is of course part of the executive branch. You're gonna wanna drill down on that study guide. Make sure you know the answer to every single bullet point. If you struggled on the first exam, get note cards out. Make write the write one side of your bullet uh, write the bullet on one side and then of course write the answer to the bullet on the other side, whatever it takes. And in your preparation, if you feel confused about anything you've learned over the last four chapters, please email me. I look forward to seeing your work over the next week or two and uh, if you have any further questions, just hit me up. Thank you guys.